next story was inspired by the legendary tale of Squidward's nose. There are many theories online speculating why he would have such a disproportionate entity on his face compared to the other features on his body. We decided to showcase our theory with a slight twist that may leave some of you noisy spectators baffled. Hopefully nobody knows what we're about to... Ugh, enough with the puns. Let's get to the story. Another day in Bikini Bottom. Another day of suffering in my eternal misery. Having these eyes fills me with so much envy when I'm forced to see each and every other person in this accursed city getting to live their normal, happy lives. I don't even remember what it feels like to smile when I watch these people wearing joyous faces just for being alive. That is, they smile until they see me. They look at me with their hearts filled with disgust. They don't understand me. They just see my face and think, there's Squidward, the hideous angry grump of Bikini Bottom. And with each day that passes, the more that becomes true. There's so much pent up contempt and distress inside me to the point that I can no longer enjoy any of the things that used to bring joy into my life. I used to love taking hot baths <sighs> late at night under the light of moon while it was highest in the sky, but now I'm afraid to even go into the bathroom. I'm afraid I might accidentally look into the mirror and be reminded of it. I used to relax in front of the TV, watching Kel BG play smooth jazz all night, but now whenever I look at the screen, all I can see is my own dark reflection and that stupid thing hovering under my peripheral line of sight. I keep all my old self-portraits around the house in the hopes that it will help me feel better. Of course, I can never hope to paint another one ever again. I'm far too ashamed of the way I look now, and all those paintings do is bring into focus just how horrible my life is compared to the way it used to be. I used to be so handsome. When I talked to women, they would look me in the eyes and actually listen to me, but now all they look at is that Thing. I can't have a conversation without anyone giving me direct eye contact anymore. I haven't been with a woman in so long. They just can't get past my horrible deformity. I can't even leave the house without hearing the sound of children laughing at the way that I look. It's not like I blame them. If I were them, I'd laugh at me too. I'm ridiculous. Not even the clarinet treats me well anymore. Believe me, I've tried to play it almost every day since then, but the notes I once played just don't hit the same. My favorite hobby, ruined like everything else in my life. I'm not sure I have much reason to keep pursuing my passions anymore. No matter what I do, I just can't seem to see past the grotesque reflection of my new hideous reality. It's like I'm stuck in some horrible nightmare that I can't wake up from. Sometimes I wonder if I just removed it, somehow it would fix everything. Maybe, just maybe, just one quick incision in the hands of a doctor will make everything better. But unfortunately, I cannot afford such things as I make less than minimum wage working for the cheapest boss in all of Bikini Bottom. But I'm too much of a coward, aren't I? Isn't that the lesson I'm supposed to be learning? Isn't that the mistake I made on that fateful day? I'm not sure, but I can't stop thinking about it. The day that my life was ruined forever. It started off like any normal day. I woke up in the morning and forced myself to go to work at the Krusty Krab. Of course, my life wasn't perfect back then either. I still had to deal with SpongeBob. Hey Squidward, you know what's scarier than a pumpkin? What, SpongeBob? A bigger pumpkin. <laughs> I really need to drop my resume off at the chump bucket. But Squidward, wouldn't you miss the Krusty Krab camaraderie? No. Where are you going, Squiddy? None of your business, SpongeBob. Now leave me alone or I'm calling Mr. Krabs and telling him you're harassing me. I walked into the stall and closed the door, trying to get away from that freak. I started taking a leak, but then spotted a bit of graffiti reading, The Flying Dutchman Smells Good. I couldn't help but find this amusing, so I crossed out the good and altered the graffiti so that it read, The Flying Dutchman Smells. Ah, uh, <laughs> I must have been a comedian in my past life. Ah! Oh, I'm the Flying Dutchman, and I shall eternally punish those who smear my name. But, but I, I swear, I didn't mean to. I didn't know you were real. Liar! Admit your misdeeds, or face the consequences. 
ye measly mortal. But it's just a bit of bathroom stall graffiti. It doesn't mean anything. You're bigger than that, aren't you? You are going to regret saying that nonsense, landlubber. Using my mystical otherworldly powers, I'll show you what's bigger than insulting me name. I doom you to suffer all ye remaining mortal life. <laughs> ah! Oh, Neptune, where is it? Where is it? No, please, no! I slowly gathered myself out of the stall and approached the mirror. That's when I knew my life was never going to be the same again, as I laid eyes upon that thing now transposed on my face. No! It all happened so fast. I replayed in my head constantly, so many times every single day. My agony never ends. It never gets easier. Actually, it gets worse. It's been ten years since that day. I had hoped that I could have gotten used to this condition of mine, but that's proven impossible. The Flying Dutchman is a cruel spirit. He didn't just curse me with his face. He made sure that my suffering would increase with each day that I survived. After a few years, I started to notice this abhorrent appendage on my face growing. Every day, it became larger and heavier. It's gotten to the point that it's so bulbous that I'm forced to drag it around everywhere I go. I now have a hunch in my back that I can't get rid of. I can barely fit through my door to get outside. I don't even bother wearing pants anymore. There's literally no point. And now, a few days ago, I think I've reached my wit's end. Mr. Krabs fired me from the Krusty Krab. Not that I ever enjoyed that job, but now without it, it's only a matter of time before my meager savings run out. At that point, I won't be able to pay my mortgage, and sooner or later, the bank will come to evict me from my home. I can't allow myself to reach that future, living in a box and begging for change. With this hideous face of mine, people will only go out of their way to step on me and not give me change to survive. I know that I won't won't make it out there on the streets. It's like a tumor that I have to live with for the rest of my life. Maybe I'm better off living at rock bottom. At least I'll know I have the looks to fit in. Um, I think that was our turn. Yeah, yeah. I need to go to my house first. Oh, wait. The next story was inspired by a legendary online conspiracy about Steve and his famous show Blue's Clues. The basic premise behind the show is that a man named Steve talks to objects within his household and finds blue paw prints left behind from his dog named Blue, hence the show's name. But most people forget about the child's voice responding to Steve when conversation is made. A clue, a clue! What? On the picture. The next story portrays a dramatized reenactment of the alleged conspiracy. Damn it, does this stupid thing still work? Uh, the camera must be getting old. Blue, get your ass inside! Come on, everyone, chop chop! We're about to film any minute now! Everybody get in your damn places now! Oh, hi, come on in. Look, Blue, we have a guest. Hey, cameraman, cut the scene. I forgot to take my morning meds. Let me just pop these bad boys in. <sighs> Much better. I had been living a simple and happy life in the suburbs, and as a freelancer, I ventured into vlogging, where I was the host of my own TV show. My program revolved around searching for missing items in the house, which started when I misplaced a couple of screwdrivers, and my dog, Blue, helped me to retrace my steps until we eventually found them. But now, he's just a vicious little thing, eating anything and everything in his line of sight. I had hired a young cameraman for a full-time position, and when we started working together, I began to share my space with him. It was the only way for us to conceptualize and edit videos faster. In most episodes, I'd make a mess of things around the house, scattering clothes, pillows, and bed sheets on the floor to show how frustrated I was while looking for something. Then one day, while searching for my car keys, I heard a whisper that caught me off guard. It was subtle and faint, yet it had a distinct and vivid tone, whispering the name. Steve. The hair on my neck stood up, and I felt a chill crawling on my skin. I asked my cameraman. Hey, did you hear that? He seemed to be confused. No? What did you hear? Are you talking about your dog barking? No, dummy! I can hear someone's voice! Really? What did they say? Sweating, I replied. It was a whisper. Someone whispered my name. Are you sure it wasn't you? My cameraman started forming beads of sweat on the base of his forehead. It wasn't me! For a moment. I contemplated, doubting what I heard was even real. 
So I shrugged it off, convinced it might have been exhaustion getting the best of me. I headed to the bathroom and began dousing my face with water when I heard it again. Steve! Come on, Steve. Bring your green striped ass downstairs or we're gonna tell your fans you wear a man weave. It was faint whispers calling out to me, alluding me to head downstairs. I followed the voice, attempting to locate the source. This time, however, it was more than just one voice. So as I came close to the living room, it became louder and more lucid. And when I took a peek, I saw inanimate objects coming to life. How are you doing, Steve? I'm glad you could finally join us, said one of the paintings hanging on the wall. Oh, jolly good day. It took you long enough. I believe one of our comrades tried reaching out to you earlier. Guess you were too busy taking a dump since you smell like blues turds, said the magazine on the table. What the hell is going on? I held my head wondering if I was dreaming or going nuts. I sat down on my couch to comprehend what was going on as I began questioning my own sanity. However, moments later, a tone of authority and reverence could be heard from the mailbox protruding from the window, telling the other objects in the room. Easy now, friends, you're terrifying the poor man. Come on, Steve, why don't you open me up and reach inside? Come on, Steve, grab it. You've done this a million times. Don't act all brand new now, come on. Take out your hand and grab that bad boy. It's been inside me for the last several days since your lazy ass doesn't check the mail. Uh, okay. Alrighty, now look in the camera and dance for me. Come on, you know the drill. Look deep in that camera and dance like how we rehearsed all these years. Go on. Okay, Mr. Mailbox. L look, everyone, I just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. I wonder who it's from. I then opened up the letter and saw a video from my father saying, Steve, look son, I know you've been successful with this whole vlogging thing, but I'm very concerned about your well-being. I just, I just think you should consider checking into rehab. I immediately closed the letter up. I couldn't bear to hear another word from that old geezer. As I withered away in my dark thoughts, I could see my dog Blue saying, You heard him, Steve. Get your ass up and start looking for those damn clues. Hurry up, chop chop. We don't have all damn day. I got some seasoning to do later. Hurry up before I rip a fat one. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Leave me that alone or I'm dumping you all in the trash. The inanimate objects began to console me. I could see that the pressure of staying consistent with daily vlogs was getting to me. I then grabbed the magazine out of frustration and began tearing the pages out of it. Ah! Put me down, you imbecile! You're hurting me! And that's when the doorbell rang. I cautiously opened the door and saw my deadbeat father. As he entered my house, he immediately consoled my cameraman without even acknowledging <gasps> my existence. The worthless piece of trash then locked eyes with me while whispering some kind of secret to my cameraman's ear. But what really made me lose it all was when I saw Blue showing more love and affection to him than I ever received. Despite all my years of taking care of that freeloading vermin. Are you talking shit to my cameraman? Get the hell out of my house now! Steve, just relax. I was going to give you a hug right after- Shut up, old man! I suggest you leave before you become a detective's next clue. Steve, I came here to take custody of Blue in your- Mailbox! Now! <laughs> it felt like the weight on my shoulders evaporated. I couldn't stand being criticized and judged for the life I chose. But everything hit me when I started seeing things <gasps> again. Like I was being sucked back to the old world I had once abandoned. No! No, no, no! I'm not going back to this life! I have to find Blue's clues! I sprinted towards the kitchen. I then opened one of the kitchen cabinets where I saw one of Blue's clues. And there lied my morning meds. I grabbed them and ran back to the couch, where I again faced my cameraman. Daddy, are we still filming Blue's clues? Yes, son. Just a second. <sighs> ah, much better. The next story featured on our Simpsons Halloween special was inspired by this disturbing clip of a clown holding a free hug sign. 
The individual in the vehicle appears to be filming the clown as he cautiously puts his vehicle in reverse while trying to capture as much as he can in this deserted road. There's no telling why one would intentionally dress up just to terrorize oncoming patrons in the area, but we could only speculate such a thing. The next story was inspired by this horrifying footage. Last summer, I moved towns as usual. My parents can never manage to stay in one place for more than a year. There are a bunch of worthless drunks that had me by accident, so they just tow me around while they circled the drain. Because of them, I can never keep any friends even if I do make some, and my biggest dream is just to be able to leave them in the dust when I turn 18. I don't even care where I go, as long as it's away from them. The last place they moved into was this dingy, cramped one-bedroom apartment in the middle of a huge apartment compound. By the time Halloween came around, I was just about ready to run away. I decided to go trick-or-treating on my own, since my parents never cared enough about me to give me a curfew or anything. They went off to their own party and left me alone, so what else was I going to do? I put together my usual low-effort costume, just a beanie, a skull shirt, and a pair of Converse to go with my already long hair and big teeth. And just like that, I was Jimbo Jones from The Simpsons once again. There wasn't any trick-or-treating going on in the maze of apartments I was living in, so I took a bus and walked a few miles out to some more upscale neighborhood. That's where I decided to start hitting houses. It's always the suburbs with the big houses that have the most candy. However, it wasn't long before I started to notice something was wrong. The whole neighborhood was dead as dead gets. There wasn't a single light on over anyone's front door and none of the yards I walked past had any Halloween decorations. And when I took a chance and knocked on somebody's door, it didn't go very well. Who the hell are you? Trick or treat! Psst. Did you get your costume at H&M? Do you get a discount on shampoo? Get the hell off my property, you little maggot! I bet your mom likes them bald in old age! I walked on and tried to find a better prospect, but I still didn't have any luck. I didn't even see a single person out on the street. I started second guessing myself thinking maybe it wasn't even October 31st at all, that I was just so stupid that I thought it was Halloween. But I checked my phone and it was indeed October 31st. It didn't look like Halloween, but the environment I was in was definitely giving me the creeps. I felt like I was the last man standing in a humanity ending apocalypse. There weren't even cars out on the street. I expected to round a corner and see one turned over and burning down, but that's not what I saw. I reached the end of the neighborhood and saw the border of this thick forest preserve. And standing right at the edge was this kid that looked exactly like Bart Simpson. Well, as much as any real person can look like Bart Simpson. He was just smiling eerily while holding this raggedy cardboard sign that said free hugs. The kid looked pretty rough too, but he was the first person I'd seen out on the street all night. So I had to go up and talk to him. Hey man, where is everybody? The kid didn't respond with anything except a gaunt stare and a creepy smile. Dude, it's Halloween, right? Do you know where all the trick-or-treaters are? Again, the kid didn't say anything. But then something bizarre caught my eye. The kid started crying. That's when I realized that his eyes were horribly bloodshot, and the tears streaming from his eyes were not clear but bloody. But what made this all the more disturbing was how he remained smiling, not moving a single face muscle. My heart started racing all of a sudden and then he opened his arms and stared at me. I was terrified, but I could tell all he wanted was a hug, so I reluctantly obliged him. I cautiously leaned over and wrapped my arms around him. While we were hugging, he whispered in my ear, make sure you get your free hugs from everyone else too, or else. I broke free and jumped back. What are you talking about? What do you mean, or else what? Again, the kid said nothing but he began to start laughing. <laughs> the way he was laughing really freaked me out. I was panicking, and while I wasn't thinking straight, I ran away, straight into the forest preserve. I honestly don't know what I was thinking running into there. I regretted it instantly. I wasn't running long before I ran into somebody else. Some poor girl that looked exactly like Lisa Simpson. She was also smiling and holding a free hug sign. I stopped running and approached her with caution. Uh, hey, little girl, are you okay? Do you need any help? Should I call the cops or something? The poor little girl had the exact same bloodshot eyes as the boy I had seen before. Again, I could see a bloody stream of tears down her face as she smiled at me menacingly. The girl then asks, would you like a free hug? Hell no! What is wrong with you? 
What do you and your idiot friend think you're doing standing around in the forest begging for free hugs? Somebody could hurt you. That wasn't very smart, Jimbo. What? What are you talking about? Speak up! Take a tree! Ah! I immediately jerked around and looked behind me, just to see a large clown standing over me. A man that looked exactly like Krusty the Clown. Would you like to know why people don't trick or treat around this side of town? Before I could even react, he threw a pillowcase over my face and began to forcefully drag me into the deep ends of the woods. I screamed and flailed my arms around, in hopes that someone could hear my cries for help and rescue me. After about a solid minute of sheer terror, I managed to kick him in the balls, which gave me enough time to break free and make a run for it. I ran back the way I came, heading for the glimmer of streetlights ahead of me, in hopes of reaching a residential area. <laughs> I could hear that clown laughing his head off behind me, but when I looked over my shoulder to see how close he was, I tripped over a log like an idiot. In an instant, the clown jumped on top of me and pinned me down, saying, You should have taken the free hugs, twerp! Happy Halloween! <laughs> Dude, where the hell are all the trick-or-treaters? This area is lame as hell. I don't know, maybe we should walk a little further down. Honestly, I'm about to call it a net. Hey look, it's Jimbo from The Simpsons. Let's go mess with him. That free hug sign is definitely a nice touch to the costume, all right. The next story was inspired by a fairly odd parents urban legend that has been quite the conspiracy for a few years now. There's a lot of validity to these assumptions, so rather than disclosing them now, we figured we'd let the animation speak for itself. As a disclaimer for any fairly odd parents fans, you may not look at the show the same way again. View at your discretion. At an early age, I didn't have the best home life growing up. My parents made me go to bed really early, so I was forced to listen to them shout belligerently until really late at night, whether they were laughing about things I wasn't allowed to be a part of, or arguing and getting into fights about what to do with me next. I can't stand him! And why the hell does he keep wearing that stupid hat in my household? I said no hats in the house! You hear me, twerp? I wasn't allowed to have many belongings either. Whether I asked for something, even if it was for my birthday, I was always shut down and punished just for having the nerve. One night, after I'd spent my birthday alone without getting a single gift, I was crying myself to sleep when I was graced by something extraordinary. I heard someone knocking on my window. I assumed it was just heavy debris from the windy conditions that night, but then I heard the knocks get louder. I then opened my eyes and saw a pair of entities hovering over my window. They were floating in mid-air, and each held a wand in their hand like they were some kind of fairy. I crawled <gasps> under my blanket as I was legitimately scared out of my mind. Let us in! Are you just gonna let us soak in the rain? Open the window or we'll shove our wand up your- Who are you guys? As they entered my room, they started floating around as the female with the pink hair said, Why, we're your fairy godparents. Do you know what that means? Uh, no. I've never had fairy godparents before. It means we can grant any wish that you desire. Sort of like a genie. So tell us, what do you want, kid? Really? Well, I could use a dentist, or maybe I should get a blow-up doll. I, I got it. I want a Game Boy. And just like that, they waved their hands, and a brand new Game Boy Color appeared in my <gasps> hands. I then heard loud footsteps approaching my bedroom. My dad came storming into my room, furious. What the hell is that sound? Do you see them, Dad? They're my fairy godparents. Look! But right as I pointed to where they'd been just a moment ago, they were gone. What are you talking about? You've got to stop imagining things, Timmy! If you keep this up, I'll send you to Kanye West doctor! You hear me? Of course he didn't believe me. I laid up in bed all night and played all the games that came with my present while hiding under the covers. A couple minutes later, when the coast was clear, I whispered, Hey guys, you still there? Shut up, kid! You're gonna blow our cover! Have you ever heard of the term snitches get stitches? I know, but I couldn't help it. I've just never seen anything like you guys, and uh, I was hoping... 
I'm not asking for too much, but do you guys mind hooking me up with another Who are you talking to, Timmy? Hey, Vicky, do you mind knocking before coming into my room? Are you talking to yourself? <laughs> Leave me the hell alone or I'm calling my fairy godparents. What did you just say? What the hell are you talking about, you little vermin? I said, leave me the hell alone or I'm calling my fairy godparents. Vicky then rips the Game Boy out of my hands and smashes it on the ground. All I can remember was seeing red when the inconsiderate brat left my room in glee while I sat there crying a storm, knowing that I would be faced with this reality for the rest of my life. I then curled up into a ball trying to fall asleep. I had never felt worse in my life than at that moment, but even in my darkest hour, the fairies comforted me and told me that everything was going to be okay. But then everything changed when the male fairy with the green hair said, Hey Timmy, I think it's time. Time for what? You've had such a hard day, Timmy. We're sorry we couldn't help you more, but we're here now. What do you want most in the world right now? I don't know. Maybe a better life and to not see my stupid family ever again. That's a tall order, Timmy, but we'll do our best. I think you're smart enough to know what to wish for. I wish... I, I wish for a knife. Wish granted. I then cautiously approached the living room where Vicky was watching TV. I then took the knife granted to me and did what I had to do. <laughs> I knew with all this commotion going on, my parents were going to inevitably hear us and intervene, which is exactly what happened. What the hell is all that noise? Vicky, what's wrong? No, 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 no! What the hell did you do, you little twerp? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing them weep was music to my ears, but I knew the job hadn't been fulfilled yet. I raised the knife up high and swung it down, finishing the deed. After that, I sat in the corner of my bedroom and reflected on my actions. I, of course, was accompanied by my fairy godparents who consoled me for the remainder of the night. I was breathing heavy and waited from dawn till dusk, or at least till there was sunlight glimmering through my window. Hey guys, are you still there? Hello? Not a trace of a mortal soul in sight. The only living person in the Turner household was the person in the mirror. I went into my parents' room to see if I could muster up any cash to make a quick getaway. That's when I saw foster care documents lying within their drawers. It had a picture of me and my allegedly deceased biological parents. At that point, I knew that I'd been living with an uncaring foster family and that those fairy godparents were just the spirits of my biological parents. I guess that explains why we look so alike. Hey guys, guys, please don't leave me hanging. <laughs> The next story was inspired by an episode on Spongebob called Club Spongebob, also known as the Magic Conch episode. In the episode, Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward get flung into a kelp forest where they're ultimately left stranded. Spongebob and Patrick depend their lives on the Magic Conch shell, as Squidward refuses to do such a thing. In return, Spongebob and Patrick get rewarded with food and necessary survival accessories, while Squidward is left with nothing. As random Scavenger then appears towards the end of the show and professes his allegiance to the Magic Conch, which ultimately convinces Squidward to join them. We decided to create a sequel based on theories online, and of course, with a dark twist. Here's what it looked like. 24 hours later, 
It's been 24 hours since I gave in to this insanity, and these buffoons are still just sitting there. I haven't had a bite to eat in so long. I can't even remember. My once sophisticated thoughts are being reduced to savagery with every passing second. The conch said to wait, but what are we waiting for? Starvation? For a wild animal to come turn us into Krabby Patties? Barnacles! That crabs must have set all of this up. I swear, if I make it out of this alive, I'll kill him. No. Oh, Neptune, what's happening to me? I can't take this anymore. Come on, Squiddy, keep it together. This is all because of that stupid conch. I can't believe those morons got me sitting here waiting to get orders from a damn seashell. All hail the magic conch. The conch. The magic conch. Enough already, SpongeBob! Tell them to give us some food before we all starve to death! Tell who, Squidward? Whoever you're talking to with that stupid conch! <gasps> Squidward! I thought you knew better than to insult the magic conch. SpongeBob, you moron! There's no such thing as magic! This thing is just a radio or something! I snatched the conch with my tentacle and aggressively smashed it to the ground while yelling. Listen here, whoever you are! I've got you all figured out, so don't try and play dumb with me! Food just doesn't fall from the sky, and people don't just show up in the middle of nowhere! I know somebody's responsible for all this, and I know it's you, so you better just help me before I call the cops! Do you understand? No. Ah! I'm gonna ship you back to Walmart, you stupid toy! I threw the conch on the ground once more and began stomping on it with vicious intent. Get him! All three conch worshippers charged at me as Patrick shoved me with great force, sending me flying and tumbling along the ground before regaining my footing. SpongeBob then grabs a hold of the conch and stands behind the other two worshippers in a protective huddle while saying, Looks like we've got ourselves a heathen, boys. We must protect the magic conch. All hail the magic conch! All hail the magic conch! All hail the magic conch! Shut the hell up! The chanting stopped as they eyed me with contempt. Let me at him, SpongeBob. I want a piece of that banana face. Hold on, Patrick. We must do as the magic conch bids. Oh, magic conch, can we take care of Squidward for good? Yes. You heard the magic conch, boys. Get him! I quickly grabbed the scavenger's machete from the ground and got into a defensive stance, halting the zealot's charge while yelling, Stay back! The trio inched forward as I began to backpedal, saying, I said stay back! Don't make me use this! The trio continued to inch forward heedlessly. Concerned, I turned tail and sprinted into the chaotic maze of the kelp forest as the trio chased me. I gotta get away from these freaks! Don't stop, Squiddy! You'll find civilization eventually! Eventually, just keep going. I got a head start, so I just need to keep the distance. The further I ran into the forest, the denser the kelp leaves became as they hit me in the face. I constantly tripped on the foliage, which was greatly compromising my stamina. Curse this kelp! I'm so tired. I don't think they can see me. I have to hide and catch my breath. I immediately halted and crouched within the dense foliage, listening for the assailants. Those imbeciles will never be able to find me. Eventually, they'll give up, right? Let's split up and find them. Come out, come out, wherever you are. You can't hide forever, Squidward. The magic conch knows all, Squidward. It even knows where you're hiding right now. I became increasingly nervous as the voices started closing in from several directions. Oh, barnacles, they're getting closer. They'll find me eventually. And if I keep running, I'll pass out from exhaustion. I don't care. No matter what happens, I am not going out like this. Not to them! Magic Conch, is Sausage Face in this direction? Yes. Call him by his name. The Conch might think you're talking about what's in my pants. Got it, Conehead. Magic Conch, is Squidward close? Yes. I found you, Squidward! <laughs> Out of nowhere, my sudden fight or flight reaction caused me to slash him into two halves. I'm sorry, SpongeBob, but you brought this upon yourself. 
This all could have been avoided. Die, Squidward! Patrick suddenly came swooshing from the abyss and charged at me. I quickly maneuvered to the side as he smashed into a thick stalk of kelp head first, disorienting himself. You're such a fool, Patrick. I have to admit, I've dreamt of this day. I started gaining more momentum to escape this hellish maze, but knew there was one more conch worshiper to take out. That's when the scavenger made his presence known as he plowed through the kelp leaves and darted for the conch, asking it, Oh, magic conch, will I defeat the heathen? No. But, but I have to try. I must not accept defeat. I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like I haven't eaten in over a decade, which left me no other choice than to feast on the corpses of the fallen assassins. Finally, something to eat! These chumps will feed me for weeks! I should have done this days ago! I'll never forget the disgusting texture of eating a sponge. I did my best to convince myself that I was eating nothing more than sponge cake. The other two were just as disgusting, yet easier to consume. I locked eyes on the conch as I said to myself, Nothing's changed. I can't stay here. I picked up the conch and asked it, All this over such a silly little thing. Will you help me find a way home? No. Fine! I'll just have to prove you wrong! I carried the machete and conch and made my way into the thick kelp of the forest. Emerging from the forest as a weathered and savage shell of my former self, I remember seeing Bikini Bottom utterly changed. At long last, I finally made it home! Wait a second. Something's wrong. Everything's different. It's all completely changed. How long have I been gone? Is anyone I know still alive? As I made my way down, I remember seeing Sandy's dome glittering in the distance. Her, she must still be there. She's the only one who can help me now. I entered the airlock and put on a glass helmet. The water eventually drained as I entered the dome. That's when I saw Sandy sitting at the picnic table with the most sadistic smile on her face. Your arrival has been foretold, Mr. Tentacles. State your business. I've been gone for so long. All I ask is for some food. And why should I help a heathen such as yourself? Wait. No, not you too! That's right, Squidward. I too believe in the power of the magic count. Now, where is it? You mean this stupid thing? The thing that didn't help me at all? I made it out of the damn forest on my own! That makes me more powerful than it! And I don't need this stupid thing! I threw the conch to the other side of the dome as the heathen took that as a sign of aggression. She immediately grabbed a hold of my helmet and lifted it off my head, causing me to instantly suffocate. Sandy then picked up the conch and asked it. Oh, magic conch, will this heathen perish before my eyes? Yes. The next story was inspired by the image below. Of course, we don't want to disclose the image just yet, so please stay tuned to the end of the story to see what this story was inspired by. That being said, please enjoy our Simpsons Halloween special. The last year I ever went trick-or-treating would forever traumatize me to this day. It started out when my friends and I decided to dress up as the Simpson characters, which was always good for the candy hall. I went as Bart because of my spiky hair. My best friend was Milhouse because he naturally wore glasses. Our other friends went as Ralph since he was a bit chubby, and the other went as Nelson since he had buck teeth. Everything about the night started off like normal, with the exception of the fact that the whole neighborhood seemed to be just a little dead, and not in a spooky way either. For that reason, we weren't able to collect as much candy as we'd hoped for. After a couple hours of roaming through our neighborhood, we started to get the feeling that we'd hit just about every house. Things seemed to be wrapping up early as a lot of the last houses that we walked by started turning off their lights. Then, when we weren't too far from getting back to where I lived, we came across a small, <gasps> dingy, rundown house, which was the only house in the neighborhood with their porch lights on. 
on. The house didn't have any decorations other than a for sale sign on the front lawn. That's when I asked, So are we going to hit up this house or just call it a night? As much as I'd like to beef up this lousy sack, I'm not sure I'm trying to deal with him. Who? Oh shit. I hadn't noticed him at first, but once I did, I couldn't look away. <gasps> Beneath the porch light stood a man standing in the shadow just behind the threshold. He was dressed as Krusty the Clown, and somehow more deranged looking than the real thing. Out of all the clowns he could have been, he had to be the one clown from The Simpsons, which made it all seem that much stranger. When he was sure he had our full attention, he held his hand out towards us and curled his finger, beckoning us closer. Of course, none of us were in the mood to take even a single step forward. Isn't it getting a little late? Shouldn't your sacks have a little more candy than that by now? Obviously, you're not very good trick-or-treaters if you won't even come to my door. You're not scared, are you? No way, man. We're not scared. This whole neighborhood is just so empty and lame. Yeah, and everyone's being all stingy this year. Don't take us for a bunch of wimps, you weirdo. Call me what you want, you little punks. But one thing I'm not is stingy. Then, from just inside the house, the clown grabbed two huge bags stuffed full of candy and hurled them out into the yard. The candy spilled out onto the ground before us, creating a display we couldn't resist. Whoa, look at that. That's more than all of our candy combined. We were so distracted by the hoard of candy that in the very next moment, that crazed clown was rushing towards us and getting in our faces grabbing at us and shoving handfuls of his candy into our bags. <laughs> Go ahead, take it. It's all yours. What do you say, huh? I've been looking to move out of this crummy town for a while now, and I'd love a little help clearing house. Get away from me, man. We backed off as quickly as we could and made a bit of space between us and him. Well, what are you waiting for? I gave you some candy. Why don't you try some of it? Nah, I think I've got a few more houses to hit before I can stop for the night. Thanks, though. Wait, I'll give you more candy than this whole neighborhood. I just want to see you try Try it. I told you, man, I'm good. I said eat the candy, you snotty little twerp. How about you learn to respect your elders, huh? I could remember shitting bricks when I saw my other two friends <gasps> shovel as much of this creep's candy into their bags while he was focused on me. But it wasn't long before Krusty looked behind the two of them in the process of robbing him blind. He immediately let go of me and pushed me to the ground. And while he screamed in rage, he unsheathed a machete from from his oversized clown pants. We all moved to scatter as I threw my bag of candy at him. The clown instinctively took a large swing of the machete and the bag split open, exploding with a shower of little candy wrappers. I had enough time to find my footing and started sprinting, but Krusty was close behind. He chased us all down the street, screaming and waving his machete at us the whole time, despite being slowed by the elongated clown shoes he was wearing which forced him to run with exaggerated movements. He was fast and kept at it for a while. Eventually, we made a quick stop and hid in the bushes by some random house. <laughs> remember seeing him sprint past us as we held in our breath for dear life. We waited until the coast was clear, in which we slinked out and snuck back to my house. However, we still didn't feel safe. I realized that the house we saw Krusty at was just a few doors down from mine, and after the chase, we were all on edge. All of my friends managed to keep their candy sacks, while I was left empty-handed. I made a quick call to my dad and told him the situation in which he said he'd be home in immediately. After that, we all just sat in the dark, awaiting my dad's arrival. There was shouting coming from the other side, and the pounding only became louder. Somebody was screaming, demanding to be let in, but none of us could even dare to move. We all knew it meant that the insane clown had somehow found us. Ah! 
Then, the door gave in and flew open. We all screamed in terror, but soon realized that we were being hysterical. It was only my dad coming home far sooner than I anticipated. He said he forgot his key at the party he just left and thought we were all being attacked. We all had a good laugh, and I apologized for not opening the door and causing him to break it down. Then, just to be safe, he drove all of my friends back to their houses. I was pretty out of it by then, but I remember seeing an abnormal number of ambulances in the neighborhood on my way home like something had happened on every block. We didn't want to linger outdoors any further, so when we came home, we chained up the door and went to sleep. Around 3 in the morning, I woke up to my phone blowing up with calls and texts from my friend's phone numbers, but their family members were the ones using their phones. All three of them had been rushed to the hospital around the same time, and all three for the same reason. The candy that we got from that lunatic was allegedly filled with sharp objects in which my friends had all consumed. Two of them managed to make it out with just a few internal lacerations, but my best friend wasn't able to. He died in the hospital that night, and to make matters worse, the house he had given candy at wasn't even his. He'd been using that vacant for sale house to lure multiple trick-or-treaters that night. Here is the alleged photograph from a trick-or-treater that found a sharp object in his candy. The victim has since reported the shocking revelations to law enforcement. Unfortunately, the individual responsible for the heinous crime has since remained at large. The next story is one of the most unsettling trick-or-treat stories on the internet. We wanted to leave you guys with something eerie this Halloween season, so hopefully this story has the right hook to do the deed. Here's what it looked like. It was a late Halloween night when my two friends, who we'll call Sandy and Patrick for the sake of the story, decided to dress up as the Spongebob characters Sandy and Patrick, hence the name. My friends were kind enough to let me coordinate our costumes since I missed Halloween the previous year. I wanted to go as Squidward, since the last few years of mental suffering had made me quite the jaded kid. Ever since I became a teenager, I've struggled with my mental health, but I wasn't officially diagnosed with schizophrenia until a couple years ago. Thankfully, since then, though I do have problems with my hallucinations and dissociative episodes from time to time, I can usually manage with my medication, as long as I take it according to the strict regimen that my psychiatrist prescribed. I never wanted something like that to ever slow me down, though. Halloween has always been my favorite holiday, but the first year after I got diagnosed, I was forced to stay inside due to the severity of my condition at the time. This year, I thought I was doing a lot better, and my parents agreed, so they let me go trick-or-treating as long as I promised not to go to any parties and to always stay together with my friends. Despite all that, I don't mean to brag, but uh, I think I put the most effort into my costume. I had the pale blue skin suit and the classically huge nose drooping off of my face, plus a bulbous bald cap to give the right silhouette. That said, you could still tell who they were supposed to be. Either way, it worked. The night started off great. The streets were busy with trick-or-treaters and all the houses were being extremely generous with their handouts. Our candy sacks were filled up quite nicely before too long. It was all very heartwarming to me to be able to hang out with my friends on such a great night, celebrating my favorite occasion of the year. It made up for missing it previous year. In the beginning, my friends and I were all sticking together just like my parents made us all promise, but as the evening progressed, we all started to walk at slightly different paces. We stayed within line of sight, of course, but we spread out a bit. At some point, the closest friend of mine was Sandy, who I could see about seven houses down the street. I kept on walking in their direction, but my attention was captured by a voice that came from a side. Squidward, help! I jerked my head around and saw someone sitting on the front porch of a house. They were dressed as Spongebob, but they did not look well. Not as in their costume was bad, but as in they were in bad condition. 
They looked haggard and deranged, and their teeth were all crooked and dingy, like some version of SpongeBob that had been dragged through the Bikini Bottom dump. Please, Squidward, come closer. I need your help. I was terrified by whoever this person was, but they genuinely looked like they needed help, so I cautiously made my way to the house and up the stairs of the porch. As I got closer, the look on SpongeBob's face became even creepier, but the most disturbing part of it all was the fact that there were a dozen and fishing lines dangling out of his mouth. You see these fishing lines? They're stuck. Stuck all the way down my throat. I had a little mishap with the costume and now I can't get them out. Need you to pull them out. What? I can't do that. You're the only one who can. I can't see them, but you can. I need you to just reach down there and unhook them one by one, then slip them up out of my throat. Please. I, that's, why don't we call an ambulance? There's no time. If one of them slips down the wrong way, I'll bleed out. If I swallow them into my stomach, I'll die. I need you to pull them out now. I looked around and somehow it felt like I was completely alone, like all the people on the street had suddenly gone somewhere else. I was under so much pressure that it was like I was getting tunnel vision. For some reason, I found a way to believe this guy. He was also doing an undersea costume, like me, from the same city in the same show. Since he was also sort of a fish character, it made sense that there could have been an accident with fishing lines. Maybe some other kids had bullied him in some sadistic, messed up way. The way he was looking at me, it was like he was begging me to help. I gulped and steeled myself. I took a deep breath and steadied my hand, then reached into his gaping mouth. I cringed at the sensation of Sponge's mouth, but I pushed forward down into his throat. I closed my eyes and followed the first string I could grab until I could feel a hook. I began to pull on it, but it was stuck. I started to wriggle it around to get the barbs out of the flesh, but I wasn't able to do anything worthwhile in time because all of a sudden, SpongeBob bit my arm. His jaw clenched down with violent force. I screamed and quickly yanked my arm out, abandoning the fishing line. I lost my balance as I tried to step back and tripped, falling down the flight of steps of the porch and hitting the sidewalk on the ground. Thankfully, I was able to get my arm out of that psycho's mouth before much serious damage was done. Immediately after, I was swarmed with a horde of people. Luckily, my friends were there to shield me from the crowd, though they weren't exactly comforting me. Dude, what's wrong with you? What do you mean? I was trying to help him. What are you talking about, man? Why would you do something like that? Wait, what did I do? Look! My friend, dressed up as Sandy, pointed up to the porch, where I then saw an old man in a bright yellow shirt curled up on the ground and choking. <laughs> There were a pair of dentures on the ground next to him. His entire family was looking at me like I was some kind of demon. Ever since then, I haven't had many of the freedoms I used to enjoy. Not until I can prove that I won't have another episode that might cause me to do harm to another person or myself. I don't know if I'll ever get there, though. I really thought I was doing well back then, but I still managed to fall into the delusion that someone swallowed fish hooks while trying to put on a SpongeBob costume. I I guess the concept of costumes isn't a great thing to combine with my condition, but at least I can say my forever last trick-or-treating experience was a memorable one. I am so happy to be in your candy shop and no. This is probably the most psychotic psychological thriller we've ever made. We figured it would be the perfect time to release it, as it is Halloween after all. So buckle up, because we're about to take you on another wild ride this Halloween. Love trick-or-treating so much. I don't care that I'm an 18-year-old man now. If anyone told me I was too old to trick-or-treat, I wouldn't listen to them. There's just no way they could ever understand how much it means to me. I live alone in a basement that I rent from some older relatives. I spend most of my days sleeping on this flimsy mattress on the floor that I barely get out of. I guess I've got low <sighs> iron in my blood, or it's due to my insomnia. It's not like I'm lazy, though. I'm a sanitarian 
sanitation worker, or a janitor in layman's terms. I work hard to make a living, but at the end of the day, there isn't much in my life that makes me feel alive. That is, except for trick-or-treating. I lose sleep on the nights before Halloween, tossing and turning out of excitement. Unfortunately, since it's hard for me to save money, I don't have a lot of options for apparel. I always went as an inmate, with the old-fashioned black and white striped clothes, and I have an added perk that makes them into an awesome prisoner costume. I have those shackles and chains that I put on over my ankles and wrists. I know it might seem strange, but I'm always so excited for trick-or-treating that I always sleep in my costume. I just can't wait to chow down on those delicious treats they give out. It may not be nutritious for my body, but it's nourishment for my soul. One night, I shot up from a rare deep sleep and looked at my wristwatch. Realizing that it was already 7.58 p.m., just two minutes shy before 8 o'clock, when the trick-or-treating officially begins. I rushed to my sink and splashed some water on my face to shake off the grogginess, threw on my sneakers and snatched my childhood candy sack, then waited at the bottom of the stairs. Just two more minutes. Hang in there, buddy. It won't be long now, and we'll be doing our favorite thing in the world. Trick-or-treating. Just one more minute now. 59, 58, 57, 56. When I opened my eyes and saw that it was finally 8 o'clock, I sprinted up the stairs and ran out into the street. I rushed up to the first house that I saw and immediately started banging on their door. Within a few seconds, the homeowner answered. He was a younger man, about my age, and dressed exactly like Pennywise the Clown. He was a great costume, I tell you. Trick or treat! It's not Halloween yet, idiot! Get the hell off my property before I call the cops! He slammed the door in my face so hard that I staggered back in confusion. That encounter shook me so badly that I didn't even have the heart to try another house that night. I told myself that I'd just gotten things mixed up and should try again tomorrow night. Not at that same house again, of course. Maybe his neighbor would be nicer, I told myself as I rocked myself to sleep, haunted by the specter of hunger. The next day, I got up at 7.59 p.m. and gave it my best shot once again. I splashed some water on my face, made sure my costume was in order and my shoes were on my feet. Then, I grabbed my old candy sack, and this time, I timed it so perfectly that I didn't have to wait for a single second. I got up to the bottom of the stairs at 8 o'clock sharp. Then I ran up and out the house and into the street, this time turning the other direction and hitting the other next door neighbor's house. After knocking this time, I was met by an older woman who was also dressed as Pennywise. Trick or treat! Were you dropped on your head or something? It's not time for that yet, stupid. Now get away from my door before I tell my husband to beat the crap out of you. I was so confused. But I hate when people yelled at me, so I went straight home once again feeling so utterly defeated. The only thing that comforted me in bed that night was the hope that the third time would be the charm. The next day, I have to admit, I just didn't have the same gusto as before. I did the same routine, but my heart wasn't into it. I shuffled down the street and picked a different house, pathetically tapping my fingers against the door. The man who answered was an older, larger male, but for some reason he was dressed as Pennywise, just like the other two. Trick or treat. You moron! It's not time for trick or treating yet! Wait for Halloween like everybody else! Why? Why are you dressed like Pennywise if it isn't Halloween! Shut up! I told you it's not time yet! But... but... I've been waiting for so long. I'm so hungry, sir. I need to eat treats or... or I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna make it another day. You're such a wimp! You better go home and wait for tomorrow or I'm gonna get angry! <sighs> Can't I just have one to tide me over until then? <laughs> All of a sudden, the man unhinged his jaw as he let out a guttural scream right in my face. He bared his teeth, which began to grow in size and sharpness. Then he lunged at me and snapped his jaws together, trying to bite my face off. Ah! 
I fell backwards and scrambled, running away as fast as I could. I shuffled back home in a deep depression, sweating with fear and anxiety. The only reason I was able to crawl back into bed and sleep until the next day is because I was so hungry from the lack of treats that I barely had energy to stay awake. I held my blanket over my face and squeezed my eyes shut, hoping this was all just some bad dream. When I woke up, things felt different and looked at my hands and they were all wrinkly. As I got up, I limped over to the sink and looked into the mirror and was horrified by what I saw. I was a scrawny, starving old man. I tried to splash water on my face and rub my eyes, hoping that I was just seeing things, but nothing I did made that old face go away. I realized that I'd been seeing things. I wasn't some 18-year-old janitor renting out a basement. I was a helpless, diseased old man being held captive in someone's cellar. I noticed the time on my wristwatch read 7.59. With nothing else to do, I grabbed my candy sack and waited at the bottom of the stairs. At exactly 8 o'clock, I heaved my aging, decrepit body up the stairs and knocked on the door at the top of the landing. The door opened, revealing the same three people dressed as Pennywise that had been tormenting me this whole time. Trick or treat. They each dropped a single piece of candy into my bag. You finally came on the correct day of the week, silly. We thought you'd never learn. Don't forget again now. Halloween is every Friday. See you next week. <laughs> no! No! <laughs> The next trick-or-treat story is something completely different from the cliché trick-or-treat stories you may be accustomed to. We wanted to leave you guys horrified, so we whipped up a trick-or-treat story inspired by some disturbing camera footage that you don't want to miss out on at the end of the video. For extra effect, we recommend you watch this with the lights turned off and the volume cranked high. This happened around October of 2013. It was a cold and bleak fall with very little sunlight where I lived. The Halloween season was slowly closing in on us. At the time, I lived with my mother, or rather, she lived with me. I worked full time in construction to keep up with the rent and pay off her medical bills, while she stayed at home and lived out her final years in the only rundown condo I could afford. A decade prior, she was diagnosed with a rare type of dementia, and ever since then, she hasn't been able to take care of herself. As her only child, and with my father having already passed away, I was the only one who could be there for her. She spent all her time on the center of the living room couch with her head hanging over the back, staring up at the ceiling with this utterly blank look in her eyes. She always had to have the lights off and the blackout curtains drawn, as she developed a severe sensitivity to light. Of course, because of that, I became accustomed to living in low light conditions. The best I could do for myself was to keep the TV on in my room and use the light coming off the screen. Otherwise, I had to use candles and make sure the flame never entered her direct line of sight. Unfortunately, with it always being so dark, I was hardly able to clean. It wasn't long before my condo looked like a dump. Frankly though, one of the worst parts of this time in my life was getting home from work every day and immediately smelling the stale urine and feces, knowing that the first thing I had to do was change my mother's dressings. It's embarrassing enough to go out and buy adult diapers, but actually dealing with them is a million times more disgusting and humiliating not to mention the pain of having to see somebody you love in such a pitiful state. She was completely helpless. I had to spoon feed her and bathe her and dress her. Basically, I had to do everything for her because she couldn't. It was like that couch was eating her, and the way she was always looking up at the ceiling freaked me out. Especially because sometimes I'd hear her gurgle and moan like she was trying to talk, like there was somebody up there she was looking at. One morning, I had the day off. I remember seeing my mother looking so pale, but I couldn't tell if she was being poisoned by the sunlight or if she was being starved by the darkness. I figured everyone needed some vitamin D, so I asked her, Hey, uh, Mom, would you be okay with me opening the blinds a little? There was no trace of a response, not even a breath. So I pulled back the blinds just a few inches. And that's when all hell broke loose. As soon as she realized what was going on, she started screaming. She dropped to the floor and started doing this possessed looking pose. I immediately closed the blinds and rushed to her aid. I'm sorry mom, I didn't mean it. I'm sorry, I won't do it again, okay? It's okay, the light is gone now. After that, I didn't think about opening the blinds ever again. I didn't want to be resentful of my mother, but this was all taking a very heavy toll on me. 
I was getting to be middle-aged, and I still hadn't found a woman I could consider Mary. There was no way I could take anyone home to the putrid pigsty I was living in, especially not with my mother decaying in the living room. But something changed one night, just a day shy before Halloween. I was watching TV in my room when I decided to get some water from the kitchen. I walked down into the hallway, guided only by the light from the TV that bounced across the halls. However, when I made it out to the living room, I was stopped in my tracks. I saw my mother sitting in her usual spot, looking up at the ceiling like normal. Except this time, there was something there. It looked like some sort of evil spirit encased in shadow. I lost it and panicked. I rushed to the window beside her and threw open the blinds. Just then, the beam of light shining from the street lamp across the street caused the dark entity to vanish into thin air. My mother was once again raving incoherently at the sudden brightness. I closed the blinds once more and consoled her. I'm sorry, Mom. I know you didn't like that, but I had to save you. There was something there. L L Are you trying to say something, Mom? What is it? Please talk to me. L let me die. I couldn't let that happen. She was the only thing I had. I could feel my world slowly start to sink when she lost consciousness. Once she was asleep, I picked her up and put her back in her spot so she could rest. All shaken up, I drank some water and forced myself to sleep off the fright of what I'd just seen. The next day was October 31st. As I left to head to work, I remember seeing my mother still in the same position on the couch. I tried not to think about the previous night while I was working but it was hard to forget about. When the day was done and I finally got to go home, I remember seeing dozens of kids scattered across the streets trick-or-treating. When I got into my condo and began approaching my door, I could vaguely see that thing in case in shadow at the end of the hallway. It looked like a male figure with a dark silhouette hovering before me. Then, before I knew it, the figure shoulder checked me to the ground. My blood ran cold. The figure then grabbed me by my leg and dragged me down the hallway at an inhuman speed. Somebody help! I was positive I was being dragged into hell by the Grim Reaper itself, but out of nowhere it let me go. I got up and raced into my apartment, only to be faced with another horror. I saw my mother, sitting at her usual spot on the center of the couch, except now. She was staring towards the door at me. She froze me with her gaze, staring at me with bloodshot eyes and a rotten smile. That's when she said the words I'll never forget. Click or Terrified, I slowly backed out of the condo and left her alone. I went straight to the office and forced the superintendent of the condo complex to sit with me and review the security footage. I had to know if I was crazy, or if my mother was somehow clairvoyant enough to see that thing. Sure enough, right there on the video was that exact demonic shadow that attacked me. The same shadow that lingered over my mother. The super was kind enough to walk me back to my home and question my mother, but unfortunately, she had already passed. I don't think I could ever see trick-or-treating the same way again, knowing that those were my mother's last words. I have since lived in complete darkness, in honor of my mother's legacy. The next story was inspired by an episode of the TV show Pingu. Most of you might be aware of this Nightmare Walrus episode, but for those who aren't, it was basically an episode that aired back in the late 90s or early 2000s that was unintentionally horrifying to its viewers. We wanted to share our take on the twisted episode and hopefully make some of you revisit the nightmare all over again. Here's what it looked like. It was another chilly night at the North Pole and one of the penguins named Pingu was left behind at home with his little brother where they played games and watched cartoons on television. And with their parents away, nothing could stop the incredible duo from getting into all sorts of ventures. Well, at least that's what they initially thought. However, earlier that day, Pingu's parents told him that he and his brother were responsible for holding down the fort while they were off searching for food. This meant they weren't allowed to leave home under any circumstance. But most importantly, they were instructed to never answer the door, no matter who it was. And so, the older brother, Pingu, stood erect, saluting his parents like a loyal soldier, giving them his words that he would never defy their orders. Then, Pingu and his little brother began watching television in the living room while sipping on some hot chocolate. 
Engulfed in darkness, Pingu felt his baggy eyes grow heavy, inviting him to bed. Therefore, he took a sidelong glance at his little brother, who was still wide awake and full of vigor, telling him that he was going to hit the hay. Hey dude, I think I'm going to bed. Aha! I win again! You're always the one who wants to go to bed first! The shorter penguin teased. Dude, I let you win because you're my little brother. Besides, your hot chocolate probably has more sugar in it. The only sugar I'll see today is on channel 54 after 1am. <laughs> Why couldn't I just be an only child? Alright man, I'm out. Pingu slurred as he stumbled half asleep to the bedroom. The younger brother scowled, saying it wasn't fair that Pingu had to settle down so soon when he wanted to play outside. But with arms akimbo, Pingu asserted himself and replied, You heard what mom and dad said, right? If we're not allowed to answer the door, then going outside to play is not even an option. <laughs> Pouting while stomping his feet, his little brother reluctantly caved in and went back to watching cartoons while Pingu hit the sack. Then, as he fell into a deep sleep, he began to feel a sense of peace, until, moments later, he woke up to the thundering sound of massive ice blocks, <gasps> and when he opened his eyes, he woke up to his igloo repeatedly rising from and falling to the ground until it shattered into pieces. <laughs> Frightened by the destruction of his home, he remained on the bed, unable to process what was happening as he was now out in the open. Suddenly, the bed started moving on its own. Pingu began to panic as the bed stretched upward, forward, and backward. Ah! What the hell is going on? Moments later, it extended high up towards the sky, right next to where the clouds and moon were. Ah! Pingu sat on the bed, dumbfounded, not knowing if he was still asleep or imagining things. The bed then shrunk back at a length that made it uncomfortable for the poor penguin to just easily hop off. That's when the entire bed began sprinting, like a robot being controlled in the hands of a lunatic. All Pingu could do was hold on for dear life as his eyes were being shut. Ah, somebody help me! After what seemed like traveling miles away from home, the bed suddenly stopped, and in a mere second, the penguin lost his nerve and voice as he came face to face with one of the biggest threats to the survival of their species, a giant walrus. They stared into each other's eyes for a moment, which seemed like forever to Pingu. And as he peered into those dark, round eyes, the young penguin arched his back as his body trembled in fear. Nothing could escape the watchful eyes of the walrus, because soon, this colossal predator grinned like a maniac, showing off its teeth stained with blood, giving Pingu the impression that it had recently made its kill. The giant then lifted his large hand and began caressing Pingu in the head like a predator playing with its prey. <laughs> Please stop! What the hell do you want from me? Can you help me trim my mustache? Dude, I'm just a kid, I'm not a barber! Help me trim my mustache, or else I'm gonna eat you like I eat my girlfriend! Please, don't hurt me! We live in the North Pole, so there isn't exactly a first choice haircutters around here! You useless brat! Do you not have a pair of scissors hidden in that bed? Dude, you probably got my bed mixed up with one of those beds in Ikea. So leave me the hell alone or I'm calling Santa Claus. <laughs> Knowing he didn't have the chance to beat such a behemoth, he let go of his grip on the bed and jumped for dear life, heedless of the injuries they may cause him. <laughs> Surprisingly, he landed on a bank of snow, surviving the fall without a single fracture. Then, without a moment to lose, he made a run for it. The walrus chuckled in delight, confident he could easily catch up to the unfortunate penguin. He stuck his enormous arm out and attempted to grab Pingu by the feet, barely missing his target. Moments later, Pingu saw his parents waving at him while hiding behind a snowbank, calling him to safety. But when the giant walrus took notice of the adult penguin, he immediately strode toward them, grabbing both of them with a single swipe. As Pingu continued running, he took a look behind him and could see the walrus devour his parents with those giant teeth. No! 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 It was utterly horrifying. The blood began to ooze from the behemoth's mouth, staining the snow with its thick reddish hue. And once again, Pingu saw that sinister grin, spelling the word death in his mind. Get over here, you little shit! Amidst the feet, the young penguin pushed himself to make a move, running as fast away as he could until the igloo was finally in sight. Suddenly, he remembered leaving his little brother, who was probably still watching TV. That's when Pingu reached the door in time, 
finally making it back inside. The igloo was miraculously back in its original form as he raced to the side of his little brother, whose eyes were still glued to the TV. Hey, we gotta hide, now! Pingu flapped his flippers frantically, but to no avail. His brother looked at him bewildered and asked, What's gotten into you, big bro? Don't tell me who wet your bed. What? This isn't a joke, okay? We gotta get the hell out of here! His little brother seemed confused until Pingu began providing more context. But most importantly, what happened to their parents? Skeptical, the little penguin wrapped his flippers around his brother in a warm embrace, convincing his older brother that everything was just merely a nightmare. He then opens the front door and reveals that everywhere was shrouded in darkness, making them believe it was still nighttime. At least, that's what they thought, not knowing the entire igloo had been swallowed by the nasty walrus. Look everyone, I just got a letter. We just got a letter. Yeah, so let neighbors say they are in disbelief and you can imagine why this happened in broad daylight when a lot of families tell me they were at home. The following story was loosely inspired by a true event that occurred on Halloween. More details during and at the end of the story. It was the Halloween night of 2010 when my boyfriend and I watched a horror movie in the living room where all the action and thrill taking place caused the steady beating of our hearts to suddenly rise. So, gazing upon him, the softness in his eyes prompted us to cuddle amidst the tortures and loud hollers displayed on the screen. The film was called Scary Movie, and my boyfriend was so ecstatic that he couldn't stop talking about it on the phone a few days prior before coming over to watch it with me. I eventually got bored a quarter through, only expressing my dissatisfaction by exaggerating my yawn and looking drowsy. I got up and expressed to him that I wanted to give candy to the kids who were out trick-or-treating. So Paul, care to join me? I asked, optimistic that my boyfriend would want to spend more time with me instead of watching that silly film. Uh, I've got work the following morning, and I need to sleep early anyway. I'll just go ahead and hit the hay, he replied as he headed upstairs. Then, moments later, I turned off all the lights in the house while the ones on the porch were kept on. I sat a chair close to the front door and waited for the kids to drop by the house with their relentless enthusiasm for free sweets while I scrolled through my phone, getting updated on social media regarding my friend's Halloween activities. Moments later, a couple of kids arrived, knocking on my door. I opened it as they all said in unison, Trick or treat! So, as I came out to greet them, I gave them handfuls of candy in an attempt to empty out the remaining treats in the bowl. I remember seeing the majority of trick-or-treaters dressed in a Scream costume, keeping in mind that the horror series, or at least the costume, was a huge trend at the time. As the night progressed, I eventually ran out of candy, so it was time to turn off the porch lights and head back to the living room. But as I approached the living room, I heard another knock, somewhat louder than before. I tried to ignore it, thinking that if I did, the kids outside would be convinced that I had gone to bed and that they should turn to my neighbor in case they had any sweets left. However, the person on the other side side of the door didn't seem to get the memo and remained persistent, so I was beginning to feel irritated, but since they were children, I reminded myself to go easy on them. Taking a deep breath, I walked toward the foyer and opened the door wide. Initially, I was supposed to politely tell the kids that I was out of sweets, but what I saw caught me off guard. When standing before me was a tall man wearing a scream mask with its large tongue that gave it its creepy look. I could tell that he was definitely not a kid and aside from his size and broad shoulders, he tilted his head to one side and said in a raspy tone, I stood there, stunned and unable to move. I wanted to shut the door on him, but was afraid that if I did, he'd try to forcefully enter the house like in the movies. While staring at me, I couldn't tell what was going through his head because of the mask he wore. However, moments later, he held his bag out, forcing me to give him treats. I am so happy to be in your candy shop. And no, I don't want to lick your lollipop, but I do want some delicious candy. Oh yeah. So make sure to fill this bag to the brim, Tramp, or else... <laughs> He threatened, in a sinister, harsh-sounding tone that made me sweat. However, I still tried to keep my composure. 
Hilarious, dude. Happy Halloween. Your costume's pretty spot on. I complimented, hoping he wouldn't notice how frightened I truly was. And then, in a matter of seconds, silence ensued. He straightened his posture, putting down his hands as he stared at me. Do I look like a clown to you? I didn't come here to kid around. And suddenly, things got pretty serious. For reasons I couldn't explain, something didn't feel right, because it was unusual for adults to go out trick-or-treating, especially alone. It was also suspicious that he'd prefer to go trick-or-treating late at night, when most people were already asleep at this time. I mustered the courage to give him a piece of my mind and told him honestly. Leave me alone or I'll call the cops! I slammed the door, but was appalled to see the guy sticking his foot out to prevent the front door from completely closing. Without a doubt, I knew this man came to my house with malicious intentions, and so I hollered as loud as possible, and the only word that came to mind was... Help! As soon as the creep entered the house, he shut the door behind him and yanked out a large knife. Scurrying away from him, I was bothered by the possibility of getting stabbed, and so I ran up the stairs while the creep was in pursuit. Moments later, as I reached my bedroom, I instantly locked the door and noticed my boyfriend under the covers, sleeping like a baby. I ran towards the bed to alert him as to what was going on. However, I gasped when the events took a different turn as I lifted the covers and found many pillows instead of my boyfriend. When I turned to look behind me, the creep had already barged in. I inched back as he slowly advanced, dangling a knife in his hand. Please! Please get away from me! What's the matter, dear? Are you expecting someone to save you? <laughs> you know what? I hate noisy, greedy girls like you who only think about themselves! Please just tell me what you want and leave me alone! You can take anything in this house, I promise! <laughs> anything? He asked in a hoarse and menacing tone. I nodded, hoping he would eventually spare me. However, like a rabid animal, he sprinted towards me, and all I could do was scream. <laughs> Had she watched Scary Movie with me, things might have been different. Too bad, though. She never should have interrupted me during my favorite movie. <laughs> This story was loosely inspired by two crimes that were committed during the time of Halloween. Both victims in each respective cases just so happened to be the culprit's girlfriends. Here's the image of the first culprit who ended up getting sentenced to 35 years in prison. Here's an image of the second culprit. What makes this case a little more chilling was how he wore this exact same devil mask when going on the prowl. The next story was loosely inspired by probably one of the most heinous, notorious crimes that occurred within the 20th century. We thought we'd feature an animation inspired by the deadly occurrence, as this is a Halloween video after all, and we wanted to give you guys something that will leave you creeped out this year. More details at the end of the story. When I was in my late teens, I lived with my father in this really old-timey house that had all these weird nooks and crannies. Him and I didn't really talk much. For many years, we were terribly depressed due to the sudden disappearance of my mother and little sister. My last memories of them were on Halloween night. My father was at home while my mother took my sister and I trick-or-treating. I never understood how it happened, despite replaying every second of that night in my head over and over again. One second, we were walking down the street together. Then, I ran up the steps of a porch to ring a doorbell, and when I looked back, my mother and sister were just gone. My father and I shared an immense feeling of guilt, knowing this all could have been avoided if we just went out together as a group. To make matters worse, our family's kidnappers were never caught. Him and I both used to love Halloween, but after the events of that year, things were never the same. Apparently, there was a psycho dressing up as Pennywise the Clown, and would go out on Halloween and lure his victims by offering them balloons, only to snatch them once they took the bait. I had a sneaking feeling that that clown might be behind my mother and sister's disappearance. Obviously, this made everyone in town paranoid about going trick-or-treating 
especially as the number of missing persons cases continued to climb year after year. Nobody wanted to end up becoming another statistic. However, despite everything, I was just a teenager, and I wanted to keep on living my life. Whenever Halloween grew near, I would try and convince my father to let me go trick-or-treating. He never even came close to it. Just the suggestion tended to make him go ballistic. Hey, Dad, can I go trick-or-treating this year? No! You're the only one I have left! I can't risk losing you, too! I I'm sorry, Dad. I, I won't ask again. Yeah, you better not. Could you even imagine what that would be like if you left me completely alone in this world? All for some candy? I said I was sorry! Jeez! Unfortunately, my father's paranoia wasn't restricted to Halloween alone. I lived a majority of my childhood without friends, or any semblance of a social life. But of course, as the old adage goes, strict parents create sneaky kids. One day, just shy of Halloween, I'd had enough of my father's BS. I hatched a plan to take matters into my own hands. My father always had all sorts of renovation work to do around the house to keep himself busy since my mother wasn't around anymore. On Halloween night, while he was working on the basement, I went up to my room and put together my costume. It may seem strange, but I played off the rumors of the Pennywise kidnapper and dressed up as Georgie from the movie It. I also wore a Jason mask to conceal my face as a sort of hybrid costume. I then snuck to the foyer, making sure my father was still in the basement. I casually shut the door and vowed to be back in time before my father even noticed my disappearance. The sensation of finally breaking free and getting out of the house for once was refreshing. I saw dozens of trick-or-treaters scattered throughout the streets, just like old times. I had to shake off the memories of the night my sister and mom disappeared, but I managed to put it aside and milk the night for everything it was worth. I hit up as many houses as possible, and filled my candy sack so much that it was fit to burst. I was out for quite a few hours, but I made sure to start heading home before midnight. Of course, just when I thought I was playing it safe, that's when I saw him. He was standing on the corner just down the street from me right underneath a flickering lamppost. A freakish creep dressed as Pennywise the Clown, holding a single red balloon. I knew right away that it had to be the kidnapper from the rumors. The smart thing to do in that moment would have been to run straight home in the other direction, but I had a deadly combination of a hunch and a grudge, which meant I had a bone to pick with this clown. I approached him slowly, neither of us breaking eye contact. Hey you, Pennywise, what are you doing out here? No way, it can't be. Is that Georgie with a splash of Jason I see? <laughs> Why, I'm handing out free balloons to good little trick-or-treaters like you, of course. <laughs> what, did you want one too? <laughs> Hell no, I know that's a trap. I'm not stupid. Oh, maybe not, but you're surely a coward. What? No, I'm not. Come on, take it. Take it. Why don't you take your mask off then? Or are you scared that old Pennywise will see your darling face? <laughs> I'm not scared. You just don't deserve to see my face, you loser. <laughs> so, you think you're a pretty boy, don't you? You're so funny. <laughs> I'm funny too, you know. I've got lots of jokes. I'll show you one. You see this pretty red balloon? Imagine this balloon is your face! All of a sudden, that psycho opened his jaw naturally wide bearing inhumanely sharp teeth. Then, he wrapped his slithering tongue around the balloon and swallowed it whole. In that moment, I realized what I'd gotten myself into. This guy didn't even appear to be human. He was like some kind of monster. Fear rushed over me, forcing me to drop my sack of candy, turn around and sprint the hell away. He started chasing me right away, and no matter how hard I ran, he was just inches behind me. I looked over my shoulder just to see that psycho's arms stretching out to grab me, like they were growing in length somehow. Leave me alone, I'm calling the cops! Somebody, help! <laughs> then just like that, his hands covered my mouth and eyes so I couldn't see or scream for help again. I tried to break free, but this guy was a lot stronger than he looked. He lifted me up and carried me off somewhere while I gasped for air through the small holes in the mask. I heard us enter a house and go down a set of stairs. Then, he threw me on the cold hard ground of some random basement. But it wasn't just a random basement, it was familiar. That Pennywise was standing right over me with a terrifying look on his face, like he was seconds away from ending me. I then ripped off my mask and pleaded to be spared. Suddenly, his entire demeanor changed. The bloodlust in his eyes drained away as he grabbed me by the arm and dragged me back up the stairs, then threw me on the couch. And that's when I realized I was in my own house. What the hell is wrong with you? Did you not listen to a single word I said? Why did you have to disobey me? I could have done something really bad to you. I was shocked. 
words in a total daze. I could barely even register what he was saying. I couldn't believe that my own father was the psychotic kidnapper from the town rumors. If you ever mention any of this to anyone, you'll be that red balloon. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Yes, Dad. Good! Now go to your room! You're grounded for the rest of the year! That night, I couldn't stop myself from lying awake and connecting all the dots. Eventually, I knew I had no choice but to call the cops. They swarmed the house within the hour and busted in, arresting my dad. Afterwards, they searched the house up and down, tearing everything apart. But what sent shockwaves through the nation? was when they discovered a secret compartment hidden in the basement's wine cellar. It was a tiny squalid den filled with all the missing people from the past several years, including my own mother and sister. I guess it's no longer a mystery what he was working on down there for all those years. Here's a photograph of the quote-unquote Pennywise of the story, a man named Joseph Fritzel. There was a woman who was held captive in a concealed area of a cellar in a basement for over 24 years. The culprit in question happened to be her own father, there are many other details too disturbing to list here, but we think you get the point. The next story was inspired by one of the most bizarre cases on the internet. The mugshot below showcases a man as the real-life Squidward, a music teacher now serving 50 years to life in prison for his heinous crimes. We couldn't make a Squidward video without including such a thing. Here's a dramatized version of the alleged occurrence. Growing up with Spongebob on the TV my whole life, I was exposed to clarinet playing at an early age. Now, I know that may not be what most people fixate on while watching the show, but the character of Squidward imparted some things onto me that definitely affected the trajectory of my life, as strange as it sounds. For as long as I can remember, I've had dreams of playing the clarinet and mastering it after many years, becoming a world-famous maestro, and one day getting the opportunity to play my part in a symphony along with an orchestra full of talented musicians. Those were the dreams that brought me to take music classes, where I did my best to excel in my craft and put in the extra effort whenever I could. I would spend my lunches in the band room so I could practice for a few extra minutes after eating, and at the end of the day, I would take my clarinet home where I could squeeze in a couple more hours. Of course, in the classes themselves, I was also an exemplary student. One year, I was under the tutelage of a certain instructor that, for obvious reasons, I had an exceptional relationship with. Everything about him was strikingly similar to my favorite cartoon character, Squidward Tentacles. Beyond just the bald head and the huge nose and the extensive wardrobe of identical brown polo shirts, his voice was just as uniquely nasally and rife with personality. Alright class, let's all make sure that we're fingering in A minor for the second movement. But above all, that teacher shared a passion for the clarinet, which I believe is the reason he began to pay closer attention to me. Even out of those he invited to his extracurricular sessions of more rigorous and challenging practice, it was clear he saw the greatest potential in me. For instance, there was this one evening when the after-school session went on much later than usual. There were only half a dozen pupils in the class, but the teacher was so committed to helping us all do the best we could that we had been there for hours. I was the only one without a ride, so I packed up my clarinet and headed for the bus stop. That's when a car pulled up next to the curb right by me, and I realized it was my music teacher. Hey, clarinet boy, you wouldn't want to be caught in this dump after dark, would you? Uh, I don't know. The bus should be here soon. But why ride that dirty old bus when you can ride in luxury with me? It's not that bad, sir. Oh yeah, it's not that bad, eh? <laughs> Get in the car or I'm calling your mom! Uh, okay. I felt a little weird getting into my teacher's car, but I spent enough time with him that he seemed trustworthy. However, I was pretty susceptible to peer pressure at the time. Otherwise, I'm sure I would have just waited for the bus. But I was already in, so I told him my address and he nodded. That made me feel a little more comfortable, enough so to make a little small talk. Well, I was comfortable until I realized we missed the turn that led to my house. Um, I think that was our turn. Yeah, yeah. I need to go to my house first. 
first. Oh, wait, why? Look at my nose! I have to take a leak, all right? Uh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to snap at you. I'll let you come inside for some one-on-one -on -one lessons to make it up to you. I choked up for a second. I was frankly rather freaked out that he wanted to let me inside his house, but I understood he meant it for an apologetic gesture, and I really didn't want to disrespect him. I, I guess so. Uh, I mean, yes. Thank you. A few minutes later, we pulled up into his driveway. He had a remote control button on his visor that he clicked to reveal the garage inside his house. We rolled in and he clicked the button again, commanding the door to slide shut behind us. In that moment, I realized I was essentially trapped. Play the clarinet. What? I said, play the clarinet. But, but why? Play it! Play the clarinet now! Play the freaking clarinet! Pushing him away from me and jumping out of the car. I didn't have time to figure out how to open the garage door, so I bolted through the back door into the house, thinking I'd be able to jump out of the window from there. But right away, I saw his paintings. Oh god, his paintings. In a way, they looked a lot like Squidward's paintings, but despite that, they were all unmistakably portraits of me. And they were everywhere, framed up on the walls and propped up against everything in the house. He was more obsessed with me than I would have ever imagined. But I realized I didn't have time to think about that, and I panicked, running in the first room I saw and locking the door behind me. Unfortunately, I'd chosen the room with awful luck. Somehow, it had to be the one room with no windows. I was completely trapped. I huddled in the corner and listened to what happened on the other side of the wall. My teacher was playing the clarinet, and he was playing it beautifully, but I could hear the music moving around while he searched for me. I was almost relaxed by the song when I heard him smash something in rage. Then he threw something else, and it hit the wall on the other side of me. I yelped in shock. I knew I had just revealed myself. He was laughing. <laughs> Won't you come out? I'll teach you a secret master technique. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! Fine, I'll just come to you then. He began to beat down the door with the clarinet. I screamed for help, but it wasn't long before his clarinet was through the flimsy particle board. Here, Squiddy! The next story isn't exactly a Halloween story, but we figured we'd include it, since it is quite the bone chiller. The footage is quite eerie, so we'd figure we'd make a dramatized version of the alleged occurrence, with also the full video at the end so you can see what really happened. I've been living with my parents for the last couple of years, and to take care of them I searched for occupations online until I stumbled upon a cleaning job at a warehouse. It was a night shift, but I was so pumped to start working that I immediately grabbed the opportunity. As soon as I arrived, I met a strange looking man with a bald head, a beard, and a bulging stomach. He introduced himself to me as my employer, only asking me for my name and age. Then that was it. After that, I was instantly given an assignment. Assignment. The only task given to me was down in the basement. Meanwhile, an odd guy with headphones over his ears, whom I assume I would be working alongside with, was assigned to clean up the first floor. He began sweeping it, his eyes fixated on the dirty spots, without taking so much as a glance. And so, I politely told my boss, Um, I don't mind working in the basement, sir, but is it okay if I swap with my colleague? His eyebrows furrowed as he scanned me from head to toe and said, Who's the boss around here? You or me? Complaints on the first day? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to. If you're here to give me a rough time, you can enjoy working on OnlyFans while I give the job to someone else. Who is that guy anyway? Annoyed by my queries, my boss replied, Look, 
You're not here to socialize. You're here to work. So the only thing you should know is that you can ignore him. He doesn't like talking to people. Seeing that I couldn't persuade him, I threw in the towel. There was so much to do, so I didn't have time to worry about anything else. Then, before I knew it, my shift was over, and it was time to head home. As I approached the vehicle in the wee hours of the morning, the deafening silence surrounding me gave me chills, and it felt like someone was watching me from the shadows. It's been an exhausting day. I told myself to regain composure. Then, without looking back, I entered and started the car. Seconds later, someone appeared in the window, startling me. Soon, I noticed it was the creepy guy, still wearing his headphones as he had his hands pressed against the glass, staring at me with vacant eyes and a creepy-ass smile. I remembered my boss telling me never to converse with him, and so, instead of reprimanding him for the jump scare, I made haste until I finally arrived home, but the next day, the thought of him approaching the car out of nowhere still boggled me. Then, as I went back to work, I noticed that all the cans and boxes I had properly arranged last night were scattered across the floor. What the hell? I reacted, but instead of grumbling to my boss, I decided to save time by simply putting them back on the shelves. Sarah! Sarah! And then... Moments later, I could hear a voice calling out my name. When I turned to look, I saw a section of the room engulfed in darkness. I shook my head, convincing myself it was nothing. Sarah. Sarah. Again, however, I heard the same voice mention my name in a low, ominous tone. I was so mad that I went upstairs to speak with my boss, telling him that the creepy guy wearing headphones was up to no good and that he was responsible for the prank. My boss shrugged it off and asked me to take a 10-minute break before going back to work. Then, while enjoying a hamburger sandwich, I heard my boss scream with heavy steps moving towards me. How dare you! I'm not paying you to loaf around, you freeloading ho! Bewildered, I stood up and asked. But I only did as you instructed. Grab the broom, you witch! Hurry the hell up! Unable to contain his anger, he dragged me down to the basement, where everything was in disarray once again. What? I already cleaned this shit! Enough! My boss said with gritted teeth, and as his face turned red, he added, Listen to me carefully, because I'll only say this once. I'll let you fix this, but if I find anything out of place before you end today's shift, you're fired! I gulped, nervous but determined to prove myself to him. Then, after my boss climbed the stairs, I felt the same presence that haunted me moments earlier. And when I looked into the darkness, I saw what appeared to be a creepy-looking figure smiling menacingly while clawing at the doorframe. <laughs> I stood rigidly, my entire body unable to move. Then, moments later, a pair of round, sinister eyes glared at me with malevolent intent. I mustered the strength to holler. However, for reasons unknown, my voice was inaudible. Moments later, cans and boxes from one of the shelves dropped to the ground, and when I picked them up, a powerful force yanked my feet, dragging me across the floor and into the abyss. <coughs> I couldn't see what was pulling me toward the darkness, but I did everything I could to break free. And when I did, I ran upstairs and cried for help from the one colleague I had to avoid, the guy wearing headphones. For the first time, he removed them as he listened to me intently. Then, he told me to cool down by the security room. Since I couldn't find our boss anywhere, I waited for him to join me, where we watched the surveillance footage. When I asked about our boss, my colleague looked utterly confused confused, and asked me to show him which advertisement led me to find this job. When I pointed to the old man in the picture, all the blood drained from his face, and what he told me sent shivers down my spine. I discovered that our current boss was a young man in his 30s who was on vacation, and that the old one from the ads had long passed away. It was alleged that he had a bad reputation for dragging his employees out of the warehouse whenever they slacked around. This was the main reason the guy wearing headphones work so diligently without speaking to anyone else. This is the true story of the time I worked at a warehouse and encountered a real-life ghost. <laughs> Who's 
the boss around here? You or me? Complaints on the first day? I'm sorry, sir. The next story was inspired by two of the most horrifying criminals of the 20th century. A man named Ed Gein, who most of you probably heard of as the real-life Leatherface. But most of you probably didn't hear about a man named Edward Peisnell. We'll disclose more details about him at the end of the story. The next animation was loosely inspired by both perpetrators' reign of terror. This is something that happened to me a few years ago, something that I've never been able to explain. At the time, I was living alone in a small one-bedroom house, and I was spending my first holiday season on my own. That itself could have been enough to make the situation feel just the tiniest bit unusual, but it wasn't the reason I was a little on edge for Halloween. A few days before the 31st, a girl disappeared from my neighborhood. She didn't have any reason to run away, so the police were considering it an abduction. It gave everyone a good scare, especially the parents of the kids who would be trick-or-treating for Halloween. The word around town, as far as I heard, was that a lot of people were scared the kidnapper would take advantage of Halloween night to strike again. I was a little worried about it myself, but I wasn't going to let it stop me from celebrating altogether. However, for some some personal reasons, I wasn't in the mood to go out. So I decided to give out candy for the first time after all those years of being one of the kids going around and collecting it. The streets were honestly a lot more crowded than I thought they would be, considering the fearful speculations. There were just a lot more parents out walking with their kids, but those parents ended up having the right idea by playing it safe. It was around 10 p.m. when everyone seemed to turn in for the night, and I stopped getting trick-or-treaters coming to my door. I turned my light off and settled in for a horror flick that I'd been meaning to watch for years. By the time I realized just how much time had passed, it was nearing 2 a.m. I was probably less than 10 minutes away from turning the TV off and crashing in bed when I heard someone suddenly knocking on my door, super loud and intrusively. When it became clear that they were not going to stop, I begrudgingly got up from my couch and shuffled to the door, making sure to latch the chain before even thinking about about unlocking the deadbolt and opening up. That thought probably saved my life, too, because as soon as I turned the handle, the psycho on the other side tried to barge in. He body slammed the door so hard that it hit me in the face and almost broke my nose, but thankfully, the chain caught him and managed to hold together long enough for me to reorient myself and fight against him. Screw off, man! What do you think you're doing? The man then squeezed his face into the gap of the door to look at me, and I realized he was wearing a disgustingly realistic Leatherface costume. Trick or treat! <laughs> then he finally stepped back, and I got a good look at the rest of him. Happy Halloween! He tried holding out an empty leather sack made out of the same material as his mask, as if to ask for candy, like he was trying to play off the fact that he just tried to bulldoze me and break into my house. I only pretended to be fooled by it, but even then, I didn't give him any graces. With the way he was acting and the context of the whole situation, especially given the kidnapping that happened less than a mile away in just a few days prior, this was no time to be acting like some dopey horror movie protagonist. The flick I just finished watching had taught me that much, and this guy looked familiar for more than one reason. Obviously, the costume was easily recognizable, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd seen his face before, like we'd been friends years and years ago. Maybe it was his psychotic mannerisms, but I shook aside the thoughts and tried to deal with him. Um, no, dude. It's way too late to be trick-or-treating. You gotta go home. Oh, come on! Don't be like that! Look how hard I worked on this costume! And you're telling me I don't deserve any candy? Do you know how long this took to put together? Why do you think I'm out so damn late? Look, I'm sorry, man, but I don't have any candy left. I gave it all away hours ago. Can't you check and make sure? Maybe there's some you missed. Aren't you a bit old to be acting like a bratty little baby? Who are you calling a baby? I'll take your face and wear it like a scarf! Piss off! Get the hell out of my property or I'm calling the cops, punk! Don't lie to me! I can see the bull right there! He pointed through the gap to the end table I kept by the doorway, and I made the idiotic mistake of taking my eyes off him to glance over. And in that split second, he rammed his arms through the doorway and grabbed me by the neck. He started strangling me with his grip, trying to pull me through at the same time, but I fought against him, pounding.
pounding, the door closed onto his arm. We were both screaming with pain and struggle, in a desperate battle for who could hold out the longest, my breath or his wrist. Thank God the chain was still intact, and things would have gone even worse. I managed to call out for help a few times and probably woke up the whole neighborhood. Help! Someone call the cops! There's a... Uh, there's a psycho! I started slamming the door on his arm so hard that I began to see splinters and small pieces of wood ricochet all over the floor. After what felt like an eternity, the man finally let go of me and ran off. I fell to my knees and caught my breath for a few minutes as my neighbors slowly came out of their houses with baseball bats and kitchen knives to check on the commotion. They started looking in through my door to see if I was okay, so to put them at ease, I unchained the door and stepped outside. I saw that the psycho had dropped his bag and left it behind when he ran away. I kept thinking to myself, man thing looks so real, really looks like human skin, it's so disgusting. When the cops arrived, they took statements from me and my neighbors. They then collected the leather bag that had been left behind as evidence. Later that night, I tried to put the situation away to long-term memory and sleep it off. It wasn't long after that that I found out what the bag really was made of, and I'm sure you can guess it wasn't cowhide. No, it was real, real human flesh. What's worse was that the DNA matched with the girl who had gone missing just a few days prior. It all clicked when I heard about that. Why I was thinking to myself that the guy had looked so familiar. It was because I'd been seeing that face he was wearing on the news prior to Halloween the entire time. Here is the image of Edward Peisnell. He was known as the Beast of Jersey for his horrific acts of terror. Edward was known for entering homes at night dressed in a rubber mask while invading the homes of multiple families at a time. Who's the boss around here? You or me? Complaints on the first day? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to. If you're here to give me a rough time, you can enjoy working on OnlyFans while I give the job to someone else! <laughs>